Audio mixers, what are they? Why are they used? How do they work? And what's with all those knobs and sliders? Mixers play a critical role in a broadcast environment as they are met with awe. In this video, we are going to break them down to their basics by turning down the mystery and cranking up the enlightenment on the levels of understanding. Hey everyone, this is Ryan Corcoran with Broadcast Buddy TV, the all-around go-to channel for all things broadcast television. And on this channel, it is our goal to equip you with the tips, tricks, and know-hows to help make you a better broadcaster. So if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you never miss an upload. And with that being said, let's get started. So before we break down how mixers work, we should probably talk a little bit about their role in a video production environment. Mixers, like their name suggests, mix. Now I know that may seem inherently obvious, but let's look at that a little closer. To mix is to combine or put together to form a substance or a mass. Think of making a smoothie in an actual mixer you would find in your kitchen. You take a bunch of ingredients, put them together, and press the button. The result? Many different separate entities blended together to form one, hopefully, great tasting beverage. Cheers. Well, that's basically what an audio mixer is doing, except rather than a treat for your taste buds, you're treating your ears. In a live production environment, there can be many different independent audio sources that need to be blended together and then sent to various places. That's where mixers come in, and they are practically a requirement in a live broadcast. So wait a second, you might be thinking to yourself, how is this different than using a mixer in a recording studio or using a mixer in post-production when editing? Great question, I'm so glad you asked. How you use a mixer can really be broken down into two categories, mixing for live or mixing for post-live. You see, generally speaking, the exact same mixer can be used in all these cases. When you're using a mixer in live broadcast, you're using it differently and does require a different skill set. That is because you are focusing more on the real-time mix of the audio sources. In contrast, when you're mixing audio sources with post-production in mind, it is usually with the intention that you are going to use software later to treat or clean up the audio sources. Clean up the audio sources. Also, don't get me wrong, you can also do both in certain situations simultaneously as well. Now the title of the person responsible for operating the mixer is the audio operator or is often referred to as an A1. No, not the steak sauce. A1 stands for Audio One, and the reason you would need to differentiate that is because there's also a position called the A2, whose role is to assist the A1 by doing tasks like setting up and testing microphones. The audio operator is typically in communication with the show director over intercom listening for specific audio cues, while also listening to the audio sources they are mixing. They're also typically isolated in their own closed off room away from the rest of the production crew, with nothing more than a window so that they can maintain visual contact with the director. This is so they have the ability to isolate and hone in on audio sources they are mixing if required, since the other crew members are usually just intent on listening to the final mix. This final mix, or what is sometimes called the program mix, is typically the same mix that is accompanying the program video. The combination would be what is going out to the broadcast feed everyone is receiving on their TVs or whatever medium they happen to be watching on. All right, now that we have a better understanding of what they are and what they're used for, let's take a deeper dive into the basic principles of how they work. To do that, we will need to fundamentally understand a basic audio signal, then expand from there. An audio signal, at the end of the day, is a representation of sound. It's a representation of sound because, well, what is sound? Well, in physics, sound is just a vibration that propagates an acoustic pressure wave through a transmission medium such as gas, liquid, or solid. And when you're sitting at home watching the Friday night game, that transmission method is the air in your living room, the origin of the transmission is your speaker, and the destination is your eardrum. Your speaker receives an audio signal, which is typically using either a level of electrical voltage for analog signals or a series of binary numbers for digital signals from your device, like a TV or receiver, and recreates that representation of audio by vibrating the air, which in turn creates a wave of pressure which carries the vibration to you and vibrates your eardrum. Your brain receives these vibrations and processes them back into an electrical signal so you can perceive the sounds you're hearing. So these sound waves, or any type of wave for that matter, have two distinct properties to them which will define what they sound like to us. 
The properties are the wave's amplitude and frequency, which can be quantified in decibels and hertz, respectfully. To keep things simple, the amplitude equates to the loudness of the audio signal and the frequency equates to the pitch. So let's break that down, starting with loudness. As mentioned, the loudness of sound is measured in decibels, or dB. This is actually a measure of intensity, which relates to how much energy the pressure wave has. Decibels are a relative measurement. They relate the intensity of a pressure wave to a normal or standard pressure. For the human ear in air, the quietest noises we hear are around 10 dB, whereas 130 dB and above are quite painful. To put that in perspective, a whisper is between 20 and 30 dB, whereas a jet engine is between 130 and 140 dB. Now the pitch of a sound is measured in hertz. This is actually a measure of cycles per second against a theoretical fixed point in space. Or in other terms, how frequent or how many times a second the particles in the air vibrate between a fixed origin point and a destination. The literal distance between one wave and the next gives the wavelength. High frequency or high pitch sounds have waves very close together. Low frequency or low pitch sounds have a greater distance between each wave. Audio signals have frequencies in the range of roughly 20 to 20,000 hertz, which corresponds to the lower and upper limits of human hearing. A single isolated frequency within this range, for example, 1000 hertz or 1 kilohertz, can commonly be referred to as an audible tone. So, with all of that being said, an audio signal is just a composite of all the potential audible frequencies at varying intensities. All right, now that we understand what an audio signal is, it becomes very straightforward what a mixer's role is and how it works. You see, in a nutshell, audio mixers work by essentially taking multiple audio signals in and then compositing the signals together to make a new audio signal to send out to various destinations. What makes them so critical though is the ability to manipulate or process an input's audio signal by having the ability to directly affect their loudness or presence before reaching the final or other separate mixes. So let's now examine a simple mixer and apply these concepts. At first glance, even a small mixer can be rather intimidating with the amount of controls. In practice though, they really are pretty straightforward. You see, a mixer can be really broken down into two general sections. Input channel strips for making adjustments to audio input signals and output master section for controlling the final mixes. The process starts when you introduce an audio signal into a channel of the mixer by plugging it in via the corresponding numbered port. This becomes the origin of the audio signal path through the mixer. Typical audio sources for a broadcast could consist of microphone level sources coming from on-air talent or ambience, as well as line level sources coming from devices such as music players or video servers. Every independent mono audio source, like a microphone, you will need to include will consume one channel of the mixer. If it is a stereo source, like a music track player that consists of left and right channels, it will consume two. In a digital mixer, the audio channel is then able to be assigned to a channel fader. In contrast with an analog mixer, typically a channel strip is hardwired to a specific input. That's why if you've ever seen pictures of older mixers with lots of inputs, you'll see why they're so massive. With digital mixers, we are able to do more with internal routing and layering, which is why you can get away with such smaller form factors. Whereas you can have more sources than physical channel strips. So layering channel strips are basically like what you would use a shift key on your keyboard for for accessing additional options on a single physical key. So after the audio signal reaches the channel strip, it then starts down a path where the signal goes through a series of different internal circuits designed to allow the operator to adjust aspects of the signal via knobs, faders, and other controls. These aspects range from the loudness of the overall input signal with the use of gain controls to the loudness of specific frequency ranges within it with the use of an equalizer. It can even emit certain frequency ranges above or below a certain threshold by applying special passing filters. It should also be noted that the order of which the internal circuits are arranged can vary depending on the type of mixer you are using. And don't worry, I'll do a future video taking a closer look at these functions in greater detail. Once the audio signals have made their way through the respective channel strips with all of their adjustments applied, they reach the volume controller or fader, which gives the audio op the ability to increase or decrease the presence of that audio signal before it finally gets modulated into the console's master mix. But just before this point, the operator can also choose to omit the signal via the mute button. 
At this point, the master mix's overall volume or loudness, as well as any additional submixes that may be in use, can be adjusted in the master mix area, right before it leaves the mixer to go to its final destination, which in terms of the master mix could be the broadcast program feed, whereas other submix destinations could include record decks, IFB monitoring, or even an isolated track of just the talent's microphone. So that'll about do it for today's video. I hope you all found the information in this video useful, and trust me when I say there is a lot more to cover on this topic. Like I said earlier, I definitely will do a future video covering the functions of the channel strip in more detail. So if you're interested in learning more, please don't forget to subscribe. With that being said, we'll see you right here next time on Broadcast Buddy TV.